Hey everyone, I'm so excited about today's episode, but first want to let you know that this show is made possible by Fortune Builders. I also want to take a minute to invite you guys to an amazing opportunity to learn from some of the top experts in the real estate industry about how to get started in real estate or scale an existing business to the next level. Fortune Builders is hosting a one-day webinar to help you learn about real estate investing in today's market. So throughout the show, if you feel like you're ready to get started, go to fortunebuildersshow.com to register. Again, that's fortunebuildersshow.com to register. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you'll find a link right below the show so you can get there that way as well. And please remember that the content of this, this show and every show is for educational purposes only. Myself or our guests are not gonna be providing any legal, uh, financial, or professional advice. If we share specific results, they are attributed to an individual or a business, and we can't guarantee you the results will happen for you, those earnings or the income will match those figures. The bottom line is there's always risk when investing in real estate. You can make a lot of money or you can lose a lot of money, and it's hard work. But that doesn't mean we can't have fun doing it. So let's get into today's episode. From a team that has $1 billion in real estate investment experience. A show to help you learn the strategies and systems it takes to get started investing in real estate. This is the Fortune Builders Real Estate Investing Show. Welcome everyone. Welcome back to the Fortune Builders Real Estate Investment Show. I'm your host today, Paul Shively. I'm one of the owners of Equity Street Capital along with Than and Paul, which is our commercial real estate investment company, as well as the director of the Passive Income Club, which is a company inside of Fortune Builders that helps investors build their portfolio of single family homes. And today, uh, I've been asked, and actually I'm honored, to be the host of today's podcast. Well, what we're going to be talking about is how to analyze your next real estate investments, right? Where do you get started? What do you look at? All those interesting things that you should know before you make your next investment. And I'm really, really excited because we're going to be bringing that type of topic, that type of education to this podcast moving forward. Then and Paul have actually asked me to be one of the regular hosts of the podcast, which is something I'm super excited about. Because for me, it's not just about the transactions. For me, I love the education part. I love helping and actually have helped over 6,000 families through our various companies that we own with Fan and Paul. We've helped over 6,000 families individual investors start their journey and start investing. And that's what I'm so excited to do a little bit of today with you in this podcast, as well as moving forward, bring those type of topics to this show. So today, the term of the week is investment objective. And what we're going to be doing is helping you understand, number one, what is an investment objective, but number two, how important it is, right? And how it, you should be diving into this and understanding what your investment objective is as part of your investment analysis moving forward. Super excited to do today's education, so let's get into it. All right, so let's dive in. Topic today, again, is how to analyze your next real estate investment. And there's, there's really three main things we're going to be talking about today, right? So number one, right, is what are the main metrics? And what a metric really mean is, is, is a number, right? What are the main numbers you need to be looking at in order to help you analyze your next investment, right? Really, really important to number one, even be able to speak the language of what return metrics are and how deals are analyzed, right? So whether you're new in this world and you're just starting to get into real estate investing, you need to learn the language. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit today. And if you've done... 10 or 15 deals, or you're looking to make the transition from single family into commercial, what are those metrics? What is, you know, there's a different language for each and how do you interpret that language? What is that language? Really important stuff that we're gonna be talking about today. So that's topic number one inside of this, okay? So topic number two is there is a massive difference in the investing world when analyzing a single family home versus a commercial 
investments, right? A single family investment versus a commercial investment in the investment world today is talked about differently. Different terminology and language is used. Different metrics, which you just talked about, are used. Really to analyze a single family investment versus a commercial investment. Well, for the individual investor, just like myself, right? And 6,000 other people we've helped at fortune builders to invest and build their portfolios. How do we equalize that playing field? How do we compare apples to apples? And most importantly, how do we determine which investment may be the right one for them? How do we take those different worlds, single family and commercial, and kind of level that playing field, equalize it, right? How do we learn the language like we talked about in topic number one and apply it to both, right? And it's a big advantage if you have that knowledge and that education if you have that, you can help analyze things much quicker, much faster for yourself and really have a better result uh, like some of these big institutions have. And that brings us into topic number three is there's a massive advantage, almost an unfair advantage that large institutions, so large institutions, hedge funds, Wall Street, these big giant uh, private equity funds that have billions and billions of dollars, right? And they invest in often the same things you and I are investing in. They invest in single family homes, right? Blackstone just put, I think it was $7 billion, I believe, into single family homes, right? Middle of last year. How did they do that? Why did they do that? Why were they able to pay as much as they paid, right? And really have an unfair advantage where they can outprice some individual investors like myself. Why are they able to do that? How can you and I take advantage of that? We're going to be talking about that today, right? How to unlock really what is that unfair advantage and how to unlock it for yourself and for me as well too, right? And how to have the education in order to do that, to apply it to your specific investing portfolio, which is really what the Fortune Builders Real Estate Investing Show is all about. So I'm super excited. So let's get into it. So topic number one, right? What are, there's four main return metrics, okay? Four main return metrics that you as an individual investor need to know. And it really is, is quite common in the industry. So this goes back to learning the language part of it, okay? So write these down, take out a pen. I got my pen and pad here, right? I got my notes here. Take some notes, write these down, right? So when you're investing, the first thing you need to look at, right, is, is understanding what those return metrics are. Return metric number one often that we use is called cash on cash return, okay? What this means, very simply, let's use some basic, basic math. Okay, what this means is, say I invest $100,000 just for round numbers, okay? What a cash on cash return will show me is, hey, my cash into the deal, in this hypothetical example, $100,000. What is the cash coming back out? That's what the cash on cash return means. Cash in, cash out, right? And what it's usually measured on is a yearly basis. So cash on cash return is usually one year, right, versus your individual investment versus what you get back out. Simple math, hypothetical situation. Put in $100,000, I get $20,000 back in year one. What's that return? That's about a 20% return in that particular scenario, right? On my investment, and the cash on cash returns $20,000 in that case. What does this return metric tell us? Why is it important? Why do we use it, right? Let's go layman's terms, right? I didn't get good at math until it started making me money. <laughs> okay, let's be very, very blunt with each other. What this math tells us really simply is if you are an investor who's looking for a return on your money now, right? Monthly, quarterly, yearly, whatever the whatever it may be, cash and cash return should be something you should focus on very, very intently. What it does is it says, okay, how hard is my money working for me in the here and now, okay? It's often called, and you can write this down, when people talk about a current return. What they're talking about is cash on cash return. What current return means is, okay, I put money in, what do I get back? Maybe not right away, maybe it takes two or three months, but you know, as soon as I put money in, what's coming back to me and what's that percentage versus what I put into it? Again, hypothetical example, I put in $100,000, I get $20,000 a year back out in monthly cash flow or quarterly cash flow. That's your cash on cash return. Now, that's oftentimes a year one metric. And this is where we're getting into and it's kind of bleeding together with some of the massive uh, differences between analyzing single family and analyzing commercial, right? 
And this is where, you know, I didn't really have this own education myself, right? I was, I started out just like I'm sure a lot of you started out, right? Didn't have the money, didn't know where to go, didn't know where to start, didn't have the education, right? And I happened to get lucky and, and bounced into Than and Paul on the volleyball court. I kid you not, we were on the volleyball court and down beach volleyball, uh, down in PB. And, and he happened to, you know, long story short, We'll make this short because we got 30 minutes in the podcast today. I'll tell you that story a little bit, you know, come back for another podcast. I'll tell you the whole long story. Um, but he offered to bring me on. He offered to mentor me. He offered to coach me, right? And that's where we are today. You know, $2 billion worth of commercial real estate investments later and a billion dollars of single family investments later. Um, you know, I didn't have the education when I first started of the difference between what I'm just about to tell you right now. I wish I had that. That's why I love doing podcasts like this. I can give that education uh, to you guys and, and kind of give you some of that unfair advantage over that new investor who may not have that education, right? So most single family investments, when they're presented to a potential investor, they they really highlight cash on cash return. And it's a year one metric, right? And it's a really good metric. I love it, especially for you who are focused on what we talked about is current return, return right now. But the second metric, right? Remember, there's four main ones I want you to learn. The second one is average cash on cash return. So what's the difference? Well, we just talked about cash on cash. What is average cash on cash, Paul? Do you own most investments right? Long-term investments, single family rentals, commercial buildings, whether it's retail or office or multifamily buildings, maybe you're looking at a four family unit and trying to compare it against a single family, right? Well, are you going to own it for one year or, or multiple years? Well, most of the time, and what we teach people is, you know, your active deals, you're flipping and getting into and out of in a year, your long-term deals, you really want to own for five, 10, 15 years, right? Most of the deals I buy for long-term, I want to give to my kids one day, right? I, I really only invest in stuff and put my long-term money into stuff that I am willing to own until I give it to my kids, send them to college off of it, right? So cash on cash return, which remember is just a one-year metric. What about the other four years, 10 years, 20 years we're going to own it, right? So average cash on cash is a really important metric. What it does is it'll tell us the same thing that our year one cash on cash will tell us, but it tells it for the lifetime of the deal. Now, we don't know how long we're going to own this deal. Of course, we're in the here and now. I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. Right? <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't be here in this podcast, but with me, I probably would still be, but you get the point of, uh, you know, if I had a crystal ball. But what I'm trying to say is we have to have some kind of projections. So let's project we're going to own it for five years or 10 years. Okay. Now, along that lifetime, there's going to be things that happen. Prime example, we may plan to do a refinance, maybe in year three or year four. And again, if you want some more education on refinances and what I'm talking about, there's Fortune Builders has a litany of education that I've done, that Than's done, that Paul's done. You go to uh, fortunebuildersshow.com right? There's tons of more education where we can even talk about cash and cash, you know, cash and cash return in a little bit more detail. I've got 10, 20 minutes to go through this stuff with you right now, right? There's hours and hours of education on stuff. So in this particular example, what a refinance is in 30 seconds is, hey, I've owned this thing. I've owned this single family home, or I've owned this commercial building, or I've owned this office building for four or five years, right? And maybe it's gone up in value and I have some debt on it. Well, I have some equity built in. Well, let me go to the bank and take some of that equity back out. And the bank said, yeah, sure, no problem. Here's a new loan. We're able to give you some of your equity back. Phenomenal thing as an investor. What that does is it lowers what we call our, our basis. Very simply is I no longer have, in that hypothetical example, that $100,000 in the deal still, right? If I'm able to get maybe half of that back, or let's just use that as a very simple example. If I'm able to get half of that back, well, my cash on cash return changes, right? Because my money in the deal now is only $50,000 at that point. So maybe I'm three or four years in. I said, wow, I've built up a lot of equity. Let me get a, a loan to take some of that equity back out. It's called a refinance, right? Now my basis is lower. I no longer have 100. I only have $50,000 in the deal. Well, my cash on cash return is going to change because the income I'm earning 
should really only be calculated onto the money I still have left in the deal. So my cash on cash return changes after I refinance. So what average cash on cash will do is it will show you year one, year two, year three, until you project to end the investment. It's five years or 10 years down the road. It'll show you the average of all those years cash on cash return. Again, we're kind of bleeding into our, our point two here of the, the difference between commercial and single family homes and how you analyze it. Very common for a commercial investment to show that to a potential investor. Hey, our average cash on cash over the five years is maybe a 10 or a 15 or a 16% return, whatever it may be. Well, if you don't have that knowledge and that education, when you're analyzing, should I be investing into a single family home? Should I be investing into a commercial deal? If you don't have that knowledge and education of the difference between those two, you may look at it and say like, oh, well, the average cash on cash is a 16 in this commercial investment. On the single family world, I'm just looking at year one. Don't really understand that I'm just looking at year one and being presented that. But my cash on cash is only a six or an eight, which is a phenomenal return, by the way. And you look at the two and you're like, oh, this doesn't make sense. Commercial far and away is better. Well, maybe not. <laughs> because maybe year one in the commercial investment may only be a three or a four. But you may not even look at that because you're not aware of the education. This is why I love doing shows like this. I love doing education like this, what Fortune Builders really stands for is getting this education to you as the investor so you can compare things apples to apples, right? Don't make the mistake that a lot of investors mistake if you're trying to analyze a single family home investment, a long-term rental, and you just look at year one's cash on cash and you think that's it. No, look at the same apples to apples, five, 10 years, whatever kind of hole you're comparing it to in the commercial world. You're looking at a commercial syndication and a multifamily deal and it shows you a five-year business plan with an average cash and cash over those five years. Run the same analysis, have the same analysis be run for you by your mentor or your coach, right? To show you what it could be on that same single family home so that you can make a better investment decision. And that's what this is really all about, getting you the education so you can apply it and make that better investment decision. So summary, cash and cash return, average cash and cash return. Do you guys see the difference between the two now? You understand how they work together and you have a little bit of the education on how to apply it now, right? So what's the third metric? The third metric is what's called equity multiple, okay? What is equity multiple? Let's go back to our hypothetical example. We put in $100,000 on investment one, two, three, right? Hypothetical investment. After that investment is all said and done and it's sold, right? We project out, hey, I'm going to own this for five years. I'm going to own this for 10 years, whatever it may be, right? After it's all said and done, what did your $100,000 turn into? Did it in total, do you take all the cash flow, all the proceeds from the future sale, and you say, okay, my $100,000 is going to turn into 150, hypothetically, right? So that would be a 1.5x, 1.5 times equity multiple. You put in 100, they're projecting, it's all a projection, you're projecting that you may get out 150. That'd be a 1.5 multiple, right? So why is this one important? What does this one tell us? This one's really important for the investor uh, who may be on a different timeline or may have a different objective. Again, our term of the week, our word of the week, right? Investment objective, why it's so important? Because you'll know which one of these matters to you, right? Equity multiple really matters to an individual who's looking to grow that hypothetical $100,000 investment over time, right? And don't get up, don't get hung up on the $100,000 investment. You know, you, you, there's a lot of ways in real estate you can invest $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 to get started. It, it really, there's ways you can invest with no money to get started, right? I'm just using hypothetical examples. So don't get hung up there, okay? Equity multiple shows the growth of your investment over time. So an investor who has a longer term timeline, maybe younger, or may have cash flow figured out. They may have a great job. They may not want to leave their job. They may have a ton of income coming in from other investments, right? They may have a pension or something, right? Like my wife works for, uh, you know, the state, right? She works for a, a state-run university here in California. So she has a great kind of pension plan set up for her, which is awesome. So for her, because we know that's coming, we can make different investment decisions where equity multiple Hey, I'm going to put in X amount of dollars. We just hypothetically picked 100,000 because it's easy math. If that grows to 
150 or 200 over a certain time horizon, well, that may fit an investment objective, term of the week, more uh, uniquely, right? May fit more like, you know, that, that glove's going to fit that hand a little bit better for that investor who has that goal, that investment objective versus a cash flow goal. Really important to understand what equity multiple is so they can, you can make a better decision. Now, the fourth return metric ties in with equity multiple, okay? Now, remember in this hypothetical example we're building, we're not just going to own it for one year, right? We're going to own it for maybe three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever it may be. The fourth return metric, and this is the most advanced, right? And again, I have two minutes to cover it with you, right? If you want for more, more information on what, the, what we're going to talk about or more information on anything we're talking about, right? Uh, we, we've got fortunebuildershow.com to get tons more education. We got one-on-one -on -one coaching. We have, you know, jump on the phone with us. We can happily answer questions with you and also get you to potentially live events where we can teach you this type of stuff in a more of a one-on-one -on -one setting, right? I, I love personally, I love uh, being taught something personally face-to-face. -face. I love that, right? So I'm, I'm happy that we get to offer that kind of stuff to investors and, and students. So the fourth metric is, again, the most complex, but you're just going to see how you're going to tie it all together. It's called IRR, or internal rate of return. Okay, IRR, internal rate of return. And what it does in the very simple layman's terms, again, I didn't get good at math until it started making me money. Right. So I'm going to keep things very simple and very basic. OK. IRR basically takes equity multiple and cash on cash and mashes them together. OK. What internal rate of return really measures on one level deeper. Let's scratch the, you know, the layers back one level deeper. Remember how we talked about we're going to own this for 5, 10, 15 years. And what we're going to do is probably at some point have what's called a, a capital event. All that really means is we may sell a piece of that overall property, right? If it's a single family property, we may do a refinance, right? We, we only have one piece of property in a single family. We can't sell part of it, but we may refinance part of it, like we talked about, to pull some of our equity out, right? That's a capital event. Like we talked about earlier, it lowers the amount of money I have in that deal, right? Maybe you own an office building and you're going to, maybe someone wants to come in and, and you know, buy a part of it, or you own a retail building or a shopping center, and you own, you know, sell that piece of it out in front that has a quick service restaurant, like think of a McDonald's out in front, and you would sell that piece and still own the back. We do a lot of that, right? That is what's called a capital event. What happens with that is we're able to lower, right? Instead of $100,000 in it, we sell a piece of it, we get a little bit of it back, which is nice. What that does, IRR measures of all the dollars you have in the deal for as long as they're in the deal, what are they making for you? How hard are they working? What's that percentage they're working at for you? That's what IRR shows. And here's again, we're pointing into point number two. What's the, how do we analyze single versus multifamily? Single, you know, family investments versus commercial real estate. You know, when I really, it took me about seven years in real estate to even understand there was a difference. I had no idea, right? All I was focused on was cash on cash return, where frankly, if I had this education at an earlier age, I could have made different investments. I could have made different choices, right? To help me balance my portfolio, to have things that grew long-term, that had a better IRR, had a bigger equity multiple and sacrifice some cash flow on some of my portfolio and have lower cash on cash, but a higher equity multiple on some of my investments and balance it with higher cash on cash type of deals, right? And this is why even in, in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we've gone through a little bit of education that hopefully helps make you a smarter investor, helps you at least be have broad brush strokes on, okay, here's how I analyze things. And here's the word to the wise. Right, one of your take home points should be most single family investments, they don't show you an IRR, right? Just in the past couple of years, frankly, where a lot of investors who produce passive single family renters, re rental properties for you to invest in, right? What's called uh, turnkey rentals, a new term for maybe some of you, 
A turnkey rental is a very passive, very hands-off way to invest in single family rental properties. You don't have to do it all yourself, newsflash. You can invest passively in real estate. <laughs> it's my niche, it's what I help people do. Um, it's only until like the past two years where people are starting to understand, hey, let me level this playing field. Why are we just showing investors year one cash on cash and saying, boom, this thing's gonna make you X percent, right? Six or seven or eight percent, whatever it may be. That's it, you know, analyze this deal and make a decision on this deal just off of that information. Well, when a commercial investment, frankly, what used to be a more savvy, uh, a more experienced, right? A more, maybe more educated investment company would come in uh, that made the jump from single to commercial and say, hey, right? Well, here's all these other return metrics and they're really cool and they give you more information and an investor can make a better decision if I give all of them to them. The single family world kind of woke up and was like, well, that's really smart. Let's do that too, right? And here's a little bit of a misconception. Here's a myth, right? A myth is, oh, well, commercial is a much better investment than single family. Not necessarily, right? I own both, right? I do a ton of both. Than and Paul, we do a ton of both, right? I run Equity Street Capital, which has $2 billion of commercial real estate that we manage for ourselves and our investors, right? And then I've helped over 6,000 families buy over a billion dollars of single family properties, right? For rentals. I've got a good barometer of both, okay? And here's why the term of the week is investment objective. Because knowing which of those return metrics fits you the best, knowing which of those matches where you are in life, what you're looking for your money to achieve for you, where you want to go in the next two, five, 10, 15 years. Knowing that and spending time there, having a professional who's got that kind of experience to walk you through that conversation and help you ask those types of questions and walk you through what your unique investment game plan should be right? Which is a large part of what Fortune Builders does. If you want more information, go to fortunebuildershow.com. We're happy to help you with all this stuff. We're very passionate about it. Understanding what your investment objective is, which really is what are your goals? Investment objective, fancy way for saying what are your goals for your money, right? When you're invested in real estate. Knowing that, spending time on that, right? In comparison to, and in, in conjunction with, I should say, not in comparison to, in conjunction with having that education of those different return metrics, having the education on what they, what they mean, and which one's important to you to help you get to your goals, that's the key. That's really the difference between an investor, in our case, that we've seen who come to us and have a lot of conversations and like, Ooh, I did this and this and this, or I want to do this and this and this, but I don't know where to start. Well, they're chasing that bright, shiny object, right? They're chasing, they're like, Ooh, squirrel. And they go chase it. Ooh, squirrel. And they go chase it. Chasing that bright, shiny object. Maybe they're uneducated to the point where they don't know that most single family investments aren't presented with IRR and average cash on cash and an equity multiple. And they're like passing up this whole world of opportunity in single families that just because commercial investments are presented better, presented differently. Well, the investor who said, well, wait a minute, let me run the same analysis on that single family home as that commercial deal. And oh man, wow, it's almost the same. Or maybe it's even better. Or maybe the single family has a higher cash on cash and that's what's most important to you, right? Then the commercial investment, well, who's to say right? The commercial investment's better than the single or vice versa. My point here, the drive home point is there's no one magic, you know, pill or silver bullet that's going to be like, this is the best thing you should do. We get asked that all the time. I get asked that all the time. Where do I start? What should I do? Should I invest into a four family or do I do the Burr method because I don't have to put any money in? Do I invest into a, a apartment building? Do I live in one of them and rent out the other units and it helps me pay for it? The answer is, it's not one or the other, right? Be an and, not an or, right? Number one, to have a growth mindset, let's have an abundance mindset. We can, do, we can do all of those things. And all of those things are a good idea. There's not one that's better than the other. Instead of focusing on that transaction side, 
let's focus on our term of the week. What are your investment objectives? What are you looking to do, right? What's most important for you right now or for you five years from now? Or what should you be doing now to help you get to where you want to be five years from now? Well, I really need some cash flow so I can leave my job. I make X amount of dollars. If I could just replace that, then I would be able to spend so much more time and do boom, 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 wherever I would, you know, insert your dream here. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then let's really hone in and focus on cash on cash return. And maybe year one cash on cash return is the most important thing for you because that helps you leave your job. Okay, cool. Great. Let's focus on that. Let's make a better decision then based off of that information or no, hey, I'm really looking to just grow my retirement or maybe help my spouse leave their job or, you know, I've got a pension coming in and I just want to grow it appropriately and safely and conservatively over time. Okay, well, then we can make a better decision and help you focus on what's best for you and your unique scenario. And that's what I really believe in over the course of, again, we've helped over, gosh, 6,000 families now invest into real estate. And that's that. it's really our formula of, hey, Let's stop focusing so much on what you should be investing in and what type of product, investment product is, is best for you. Let's then focus on you. What's your investment objective? Hone in on that and then get the education on what the different options are, right? How does commercial operate differently than a single family? There's pros and cons with each, right? What are the different return profiles and metrics that we just covered that are most appropriate to you? So when you combine the investment objective with the education, that's when your uh, dangerous investor is the wrong word, really more educated, knowledgeable, effective investor. Okay. So this kind of ties into this last part of it, right? Is how to unlock this unfair advantage that large institutions, you know, hedge funds, private equity firms, Wall Street, right? These big kind of scary institutions that people you know, kind of have a bad rap in today's uh, news media, right? Is, is what's the unfair advantage that they have over you and me, right? As individual investors. Well, kind of the, 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 the blunt answer very simply is they're able to pay more than you and I are often. Well, why is that? Why can they outprice an individual investor? Of course, they have more dollars, right? But even then, it goes, people all say, oh, well, they have more money than me, so they can pay more than me. Well, no, not necessarily, because they have returns that they have to hit. They have investors that they're responsible to, to make money for, right? They have investors that need to make a return on their money. But what these large institutions do, on cut to the chase, what the unfair advantage is, is they have spent so much time, so much time on exactly what we just talked about. They spent so much time on what their investment objective is that they will often sacrifice some of the other objectives in order to hit their main one. Let me give you an example. Blackstone just spent about middle of last year just spent, I believe it was seven billion. It was either seven billion or seventeen billion. I can pull up the headline here in a minute, if, if you know, or you can pull it up at home. Actually, more effectively than I can, um, you know, Blackstone billions of dollars into single-family rentals. Well, why? Well, it hit some of the return metrics. One of the four, <laughs> I guarantee it hit one of the four return metrics that they had internally. And if you did the math on what they bought, they bought it at quite a large price per house or price per unit, however you want to call it, right? They're buying individual houses. And some of us individual investors are sitting back and doing the math and kind of penciling it out and being like, wow, that's an average of X amount per house. Wow. How are they able to pay that much? And that's the unfair advantage that a lot of people think. Well, how do we take that, learn from it and apply it to our own world? Okay. Apply it to your portfolio and my portfolio. Well, Frankly, I think the unfair advantage, again, boiling it down, they're able to pay more because they don't just get hung up on the way most single family investments are analyzed and presented, right? Like we talked about year one, cash on cash, right? 
most of, you know, now that, you know, people who don't listen to this podcast, people don't have the education, aren't in the fortune builders family, right? Don't have the education that we have. They may stop there and they may say, oh, well, this is the main profit center that single family rentals have. Let me look at just year one cash on cash. Blackstone and these other large institutions, these Wall Street firms, these private equity firms, they have better knowledge. They have better education. They have that arbitrage of information, right? Remember that fancy term? All it means is they're a little more educated than the average investor. They know a little bit more than the average investor. And they're able to say, let me look past just year one, cash on cash. What can I pay for this based off the information they have of what they project the value of those homes to go up to, right, over time? They may have said internally, well, we want to hit a certain equity multiple or a certain IRR, right? And remember, those often kind of work differently than cash on cash, don't they? Cash on cash is based off the current income, right? Where equity multiple takes current income into effect, but also takes the future sale, right? And the refinances, like we talked about, right? When you look at IRR. So did Blackstone make a better, you know, good or bad investment? Well, ultimately, it's up to them. I don't know their internal criteria and what their investment objective is. But that's the unfair advantage. They have their investment objectives down to a T. And they have an army of analysts who went to all these fancy places, got these fancy degrees, to give them the financial projections to say, okay, if I invest that same hypothetical $100,000, what will it turn into? And I'm guessing in this particular case, right, where Blackstone made a, a multiple billion dollar bet on single family homes, that it wasn't just a cash flow investment. They looked past that and they looked at all four of those return metrics and they had one that hit for them. And they said, yes, this hits, right? And they've got all the data to prove it. And that's my take home point and why our term of the week is investment objective is if you had that same investment objective that Blackstone did, right? In this case, let's hypothetically pick equity multiple was theirs. They wanted to turn a dollar into two dollars, right? They wanted to turn a dollar into a dollar fifty, right? The equity multiple, like we talked about. If you had that same investment objective, you'd spent the time, analyzed it, looked at it, knew that to your core. Yep, this is what I should be doing. You had gotten coaching, you'd gotten a mentor, you'd gotten somebody to help you analyze this, who has the experience, who can help you walk through that conversation. You'd be able to do the same thing they did, pay the same price they did. You may not be able to make the same billion dollar type investment, but you can do it on a smaller scale. Same thing they're doing, right? That's why my take home point today is spend the time on investment objectives. That's why it's our term of the week, right? Spend the time there. Get the knowledge and education like on the different return metrics like we did in about 20, 30 minutes today. And really spend that time to get that knowledge and education and then try to get a coach, try to get a mentor, try to get someone who's got the experience to walk you through that who can double check and ask, you know, Ask those types of questions that make you think, make you pause, make you slow down, not chase those bright, shiny objects and stay disciplined to your investment approach, right? And those are the most experienced, most successful. I shouldn't say most experienced because investors who have no experience can do that, right? It just takes discipline. Discipline is, a, is something you can learn, right, over time. And discipline is something you can do. Once you have the education, you've got that game plan, you can be a disciplined investor on your first go around, right? That's what Fortune Builders are here to do and here to help you about. So... What we've covered today kind of in summary, in recap, right, is how to analyze your next deal. What are the things you need to be looking at, right? Cash on cash return, average cash on cash return, equity multiple, IRR. What is that language? What do those mean, right? Most single families, when they're presented or when they're analyzed, don't make the mistake that most investors make and just focus on year one. Just focus on one of those four metrics. Run the analysis. Go the extra step. Have whoever's working with you or or potentially you're going to be in uh, buying those properties from, right? Have them go that extra step and give you all four of those return metrics. Right? It's to equalize that playing field, whether it's a four family or a single family or a office building or a retail deal, shopping center, whatever it is, right? You know those four metrics. And now you know how to level that playing field, right? And then that third thing, whoop, third, I did four there. The third thing is... Um, right? That investment objective. That's the unfair advantage that a lot of these firms have, right? That you as an investor, it's easy to get caught up in the emotion of it. It's 
it's easy to get caught up in the, the emotion because houses are emotional, right? Like they, it's not just the dollars and cents and on paper thing. Houses have emotion to them. We get excited about them, right? You're listening to this podcast because you're probably excited about real estate. I am too. I love it. But how do we stay disciplined and focused as we spending time on that investment objective, right? That's what we're here to do. It's why this, you know, Fortune Builders Real Estate Investing Show exists is to help you get that education and knowledge so you can make the best decisions possible for your investing career. So again, if you'd look uh, for some more information on anything we talked about today, fortunebuildersshow.com. Quick note before I go, we actually do have, and I'm really excited about this because for the last couple of years, we haven't been able to be live. We do have one of our largest conference, in fact, the largest conference of the year is Real Estate Ignite. It's in Las Vegas. It is live and in person. I'm going to be there. Than's going to be there. Paul's going to be there. JD's going to be there. All uh, some of our um, best friends in real estate, some of our uh, biggest partners in real estate are going to be there teaching, educating, mingling, shaking hands face to face again. We're so excited. Uh, it's in Las Vegas, November 11th to 13th. You can go to fortunebuildershow.com and get more information there about it. Something I'm super excited about. So um, in sign off here, again, I'm excited to be on this podcast and the show with you on a regular basis now um, to give you kind of that long-term investment type of a uh, viewpoint, right? How do we analyze long-term deals? How do we analyze your next investment deal? What's the difference between commercial and single family? And how do we decode this long-term investment world for cash flow, for wealth generation, to help you build a portfolio of real estate that, that you know does whatever it is you want to do? That's my whole world. That's what we do uh, in my world here at Fortune Builder. So excited to bring that to you on a regular basis. Honored to be one of the hosts here at Fortune Builder's Real Estate Investment Show moving forward. I'm going to sign off like this, just like we always do. Um, take care of yourself. And in today's world, if you can try to take care of at least one other person alongside you, take care.